me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Tibor Molnar. He's currently an honorary associate at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Sydney. He teaches philosophy and science at the Centre for Continuing Education and the WEA, and he's also currently working on a book. So please make welcome Tibor Molnar. Thank you, everyone. Um, three, wa three warnings before I start. Number one, this talk may contain traces of nuts. So if you're allergic, be prepared. Number two, it's a rather long talk. It'll go over time, so I hope you've all brought your pyjamas with you. Um, and number three, I'm going to get a little bit controversial. It's what philosophers do best, of course, uh, and it's a particular specialty of mine, as a couple of you, I think, already know. I draw a little bit of uh, encouragement from A.J. Eyre, who famously said that uh, it's only because some people make trouble that anything of any importance ever gets done. So uh, let's see if I can make some trouble and let's see if we can do something interesting this afternoon. Okay, let me start by defining what science is, given that we're a science group and you're all interested in talking about science and philosophy. Science is a quest to answer just one question. It's not a trivial question. It's a very difficult question to answer. But the question itself is simple enough. It's just we want to know what the world is like in order that it produce the phenomena that we observe. Is everyone happy with that definition? It's a pretty easygoing definition. Um, in other words, it's about trying to work out what the hell is going on. That's really what we want to know. Uh, and this is how we do it. This is a little flow chart that I drew up of what happens. We have experiences in the world. We can't help it. We open our eyes in the morning and we start experiencing what goes on around us. We make observations about these and then we think about them. Uh, and, and then we might even act on them to see if we do something, what effect it has, and we experience the results of our actions. And we go round and round this loop countless number of times every single day. And along the way, we accumulate some knowledge. And then what we do is we apply our knowledge and our experience and our ability to predict what goes on, and we produce some technology out of all this. So technology on this interpretation is a byproduct of science. You need to do the science first in order to produce the technology. It might be the motivation for doing science to produce the technology, but you don't start with the technology. You have to start with the science. You've got to go around that loop, and then later on the technology will follow. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on what goes on in here. This is the interesting bit. OK. Presumably, I suppose, that there is something that the world is like. So there is an answer, one answer, which is the right answer to the question, what must the world be like? So who thinks that's true? Who thinks there is one answer? Anyone? Who thinks there's many answers? Okay. Isn't the one answer that there is many answers? Isn't that one answer? I told you I was going to get tricky on you. All right? Is, is, isn't that what's going on here? However complicated it is, it is ultimately the answer. So you don't cop out of it. You don't get out of it by saying, oh, yeah, but there's many answers. It just means whatever answer you've got is incomplete. But if you've got the one answer, however complicated it is, it's going to be the answer. There is a way the world is like. I think that's the point I'm trying to make. So we may ask this question, who thinks that science should be pursuing this correct answer? Who thinks they shouldn't bother? Who thinks they shouldn't be bothered looking for it? Who thinks they didn't put their hand up? That's about most of you. Let's try that again. There's going to be plenty of audience participation in this talk, so you better get practicing with, with doing your exercises, okay? So let's try that again. Who thinks science should be pursuing this answer, finding out what science is like? All right, who thinks not? Okay, well, that's more like it, I think, because I think we all want answers. We all want, we all want to know. A follow-up question is, okay, is science actually doing it? Do we think science is pursuing the correct description of reality? Who thinks yes? Okay, about half of you. Who thinks no? Okay. 
Half the time? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Okay, so the jury's out. Well, let's see. Let's have a closer look to see what the scientists are telling us about what the world is like. Back in the 1920s, Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding. Okay, and the further out you look, the further, the faster it is expanding. So the world's doing something strange, and we worked out from that that uh, it must have been smaller yesterday than it is today. And good old Monsignor Lemaitre actually worked out that if you follow that all the way back, then there could have been a little pop at the beginning where nothing became something and the whole thing started, the whole expansion process started. So by extrapolating backwards, we worked out that it might have gone bang. The echo of that Big Bang is still resonating, is still all around us today. We call it the cosmic microwave background radiation, and it was discovered, or it was observed, by Penzias and Wilson in 1964. It was actually discovered by a fellow called McKellar, a Canadian, in 1941, but he died before he got the Nobel Prize. So these people got the Nobel Prize instead. Our best estimate of what this echo looks like is this, okay? It's the world's first and largest Rorschach test. Um, <clears throat> but, the, but the maths didn't work out. When we did the, uh, the maths, to, at the, you could look at all the freckles and try and work out what was going. It didn't work terribly well. It had a number of problems. Uh, one of them is that the difference in temperature, the, the, this is a heat map, by the way, so the blue bits are the cooler bits and the red bits are the slightly hotter bits, but the difference is only one part in 100,000. It's very small. It's too small. So in order to fix that, Alan Guth came up with the idea that there was this massive hyperinflation right at the beginning, even before we got the cosmic microwave background radiation, there was this massive hyperinflation and that smoothed everything out. So this is what is known in technical terms as a kludge. All right? It's a fix. It didn't work. We don't understand it. So let's make up something that will work. Let's put in this inflation thing and, 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 and then all of a sudden the maths works out. That's wonderful. In fact, it worked out so well that uh, Alan Guth and his colleagues got the 2002 Direct Prize for it. Okay, so this gives us a picture of the universe. It looks a bit like this. Uh, there was a, a, a bang somewhere back here. The cosmic microwave background radiation emerged about 380 or 375,000 years later. And the universe has been expanding nicely ever since. And stars formed and galaxies formed and here we are. But again, that didn't last long because the maths didn't work out. Brian Schmidt from the ANU and a few other people in 1998 discovered that the uh, distant galaxies and distant quasars were somehow moving away from us, were further away than they should be. And it turns out the only way to make sense of that is that the universe is accelerating in its expansion. It's not just expanding, but it's expanding faster. It's getting bigger, but it's getting bigger faster than it was getting bigger yesterday. Okay, so uh, that meant that our universe actually now looks like this, and if you wait long enough, it'll end up looking like this. This is where it'll all go, but you've got to wait about 100 billion years, so don't rush. Okay, but the math still didn't work out because gravity wasn't working, all sorts of things weren't working, so we had to invent some other stuff. We needed some energy to actually push the universe apart to make it all accelerate. So uh, that required we invent some dark energy. That's all this dark stuff over here. And 75% of whatever the universe is made of is supposed to be this dark energy which we knew nothing about until about 20 years ago. Uh, the other 27% over here is dark matter, which is another kludge. It's another fix to make gravity work because galaxies don't go around the right way and things aren't just happening right and light's not bending around galaxies with, uh, with uh, gravitational lensing and so on. That's not quite giving the answers that we expect. So we've got to fix it and we found that we could fix it if we just made up this thing called dark matter. So we invented that as well. We keep making this stuff up and it turns out that uh, we only know about, we only see less than 5% of everything there is out in the universe. Now that's no surprise. I think it would be naive of us to assume that suddenly we could see absolutely everything in the world and, and we're masters of the universe. I think that's a bit ambitious. So I'm quite happy to accept the fact that there's lots of stuff out there that we don't know about and we don't see. After all, we're just detectors, right? We've got cameras, microphones, 
that's really all we are. We're just a detector machine and we have certain bandwidths and we detect certain things and not others. So that's okay. I, I'm not unhappy with that. But it does mean there's an awful lot out there that we don't know. I asked a, uh, a Dr. Vincent Smith. He's at the University of Bristol. He works at CERN. He's a particle physicist. He's involved on the uh, CMS experiment, one of the big detectors. And he gave a talk at New South Wales University back in 2014. Uh, he was talking about gravity because it was the centenary of uh, Einstein's general theory. And I asked him at the question time at the end, said, now, we've got two ways we can proceed here. One is that, yes, you need this dark matter, and the dark matter's there, and it fixes everything up, and that's how the world works. The other one is that we got our theory of gravity wrong. Okay? And I said, look, I don't want to be a rat bag. I don't want to make a nuisance of myself, despite the fact that I'm a philosopher. Uh, and, I, and I said, can you confidently say that it really isn't the case that the theory of gravity is wrong and that we do need the dark matter stuff? Or is the question still on the table and, and, and somehow or other the theory of gravity may be wrong? And he quite openly admitted that the theory of gravity could be wrong. So the scientists aren't as sure about all this as they would have you believe. They'd like you to buy this story. This is, this is the current flavour of the month, but there's no guarantee that it's right. And I think you have every right to ask questions and be a little bit sceptical about it. Down on the particle scale, of course, they smash particles together and you get pictures like this. Um, and you try and unpack all that. And from that, you work out that the universe is made of all these bits, but that may be only half of them, maybe only a fraction of them. And this standard model of ele uh, elementary particles, there are now over 200 varieties of these elementary particles. The one conclusion I draw from that is that if you've got over 200 of them, they're not really terribly elementary, are they? There seems to be a too few, few too many to be elementary. There must be something else going on. The fact that they're not particles is a separate issue. I won't go there today. But I could paraphrase Douglas Adams. Uh, in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, Douglas Adams famously said, uh, or not Douglas, uh, Beeblebrock said this. He said, uh, there's really only two things you need to remember about parallel universes. One is that they're not parallel. And the other one is they're not really universes either. Now, I could tell you the same thing about elementary particles, and I won't tell you what the two things are. Down on an even lower scale, um, on the empty space scale, on the quantum string theory loopy stuff, this is what empty space is supposed to look like. Frank Woodsack got a Nobel Prize in 2004, and this was part of his presentation at the time. This is part of his story. This is what empty space looks like. Now, you all knew that, didn't you? Right? You all expected empty space to look just like this. I'm sure of it. I mean, we all, it's intuitive, isn't it? How, how could you possibly not think this? Again, there's absolutely no evidence for it. It's all mathematics. This is a mathematical model. It's not a photograph. No one's ever been down there to have a look at this stuff. But because we need it, mathematically for the other theories that we have to work, we need to invent something that does something like this to justify why we think some of our theories are right. So again, the only reason for this is that somebody thought it was a good idea and it was mathematically made something else work. There's absolutely no guarantee this is how the universe is. In fact, I think it's a bit, it looks a bit unlikely to me. I don't think empty space looks like that. Okay, then there's relativity, of course, Einstein's uh, hypothesis of, the, uh, of 1915. It's based on two postulates. The first postulate is the principle of equivalence, which says that if you're in a spaceship sitting on the ground or you're in a spaceship accelerating at 1g, there's no physics experiment you can do to tell the difference. And that's true. That's been verified experimentally. I'm quite happy with that. I'm a little bit less happy about this one. This is his second postulate, which is that the speed of light is constant in all inertial frames of reference. On the left frame, there's someone on the ground and observes the wristwatch of the lady up in the spaceship and says, your watch is running slow. On the right-hand frame, the very same lady on the spaceship is watching the Earth go by underneath her as she rockets past, and she says, your watch is running slow. So if something's moving relative to you, it's running slow. Now, there's a contradiction between those two, and it's a really tricky business to try and work out how that works. It gets even more interesting when you introduce gravity. 
This is the world's, far, this is the world's most precise clock. It was built by uh, Bill Phillips and a few other people. Bill Phillips comes from Adelaide. Um, it's built at the NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, over in the States. It's a strontium lattice clock, um, and it is accurate to one second within 60 billion years. That's how precise it is. And they've got multiples of these. They've built several of them. It doesn't look like a clock, but it's actually some strontium somewhere buried in there. All the blue light you can see is blue laser light they're using to strobe the strontium. The strontium atoms are going to get excited and they're going to bounce up and down and do things. Then you count the bounces, and that's what you use as a clock. And it's very precise, very accurate. They've got two of these sitting side by side on a bench, okay? And they keep perfect time with each other. They also keep the internet, GPS, everything else running perfectly to time. The whole world runs on these clocks. There's a set of these in Paris, a set in America, and there's a set somewhere else in the world, and the three of them coordinate, and they, they basically decide what time it is. Um, however, if you get one of these clocks and you lift it up by two centimetres, you put a brick under it, now the two clocks don't keep the same time anymore. The one that you've lifted up runs fast. There's something going on about gravity that we haven't quite yet got a handle on. Einstein's theory describes it, but he doesn't offer any mechanism for what might be causing that to occur. A mathematical description is not the same as an explanation for why it happens. Fascinating. Now, you could ask, I suppose, you could ask if this is uh, time dilation or clock dilation. I like to think it's more clock dilation rather than time dilation. But one thing is for certain, the world is very strange, it's full of surprises, and things are mostly not as they seem. Okay, I, I hope I've made that case strongly enough. Now, but that means it's very difficult to explain. It doesn't stop the scientists from trying to explain it. This is what they say. Stephen Hawking, for example, says the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Now I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask you about that, like how does anything create itself? I thought you had to exist in order to create something. Secondly, how do you do it from nothing? And the third rule is, well, how does the law of gravity do it? There's, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you sit down and ask some really critical questions about it. Lawrence Krauss gets him out of jail because he says, nothing is every bit as physical as something. So that's fine, good. That means that you can make it out of nothing because you're really making it out of something. You just think that something is nothing. I don't understand that either. I used to think that nothing was the absence of something. Lawrence Krauss wants to think that nothing is the presence of something. I'm not sure I understand this, but there it is. It's in the book, okay? I'm, I'm not making this up. Now, there is, of course, a rude story going around. It's somewhat unkind. Someone famously said, Lawrence Krauss doesn't understand nothing. Okay, um, Brian Greene, of course, thinks that the universe, he's, he's a string theorist, he thinks that all of the world, the universe is made of six dimensional vibrations in tiny loops of virtual string. Now this is the Alice in Wonderland version of physics. This is where the vibrations are there, but the string is not. It's a little bit like the grin on the cat when the cat's not there, isn't it? It's all about the vibrations, but there's no string. So again, I'm not sure that I understand quite, so, quite what is involved in this, but it really is an interesting sort of matter-free world where there's no substance, it's just all effects. There are lots of effects, but no causes. I'm not sure how that works either. Okay, then there's uh, Max Tegmark. He thinks that the whole universe is made of mathematics. It's not made of stuff, there's no energy, there's no matter, no nothing. It's all made of mathematics. And he's not alone. The world's top mathematician is, in fact, Roger Penrose, and he thinks the same. Clearly, these are mathematicians. They would think that, right? <laughs> you can only smile. But I don't understand what it means for the universe to be made of mathematics, but again, it's in the book. Fred Allen Wolf thinks that physical objects are made from information coming back from the future. He's even more ambitious. Okay, he says, the world we see out there appears in physical form because information from the past and from the future joins for a momentary flash of consciousness. Throw out either of these, the information from the past or the future, and nothing would exist as a physical object. 
I don't understand that, I'm sorry. I don't quite follow what that means either. And this is a former professor from physics at San Diego. I don't understand how this is physics. Again, go figure. He goes on, of course. He also says, the reality we observe depends on us. It depends on how we choose to refer to it. He says the, the reality is a question of self-reference. In other words, the universe is, or reality is, whatever you imagine it to be. You can make it up as you like. I don't think that's right either, somehow. That, I'm troubled by that. Vladko Vedral is a uh, professor of uh, quantum information at, uh, at Oxford. You won't be able to read that, so I'll magnify it. He says, information and not matter or energy or love or anything else. He says, information is the building block on which everything is constructed. He goes on to say information. Then this gets uh, Stephen Hawking out of jail again. He says, information, in contrast to matter or energy, is the only thing that we know, the only concept that we currently know that, we, that can explain its own origins. In other words, it can create itself. Okay? So if the universe is made of information, then that can create itself, and then Stephen Hawking is all right again. Again, I still don't understand it. It's nice and consistent, but it doesn't make any sense. Paul Davies thinks that objective reality out there all the time is a fallacy. There's actually no reality out there at all. There's no world. You're just imagining it. You're making it all up. And he's not alone. But what does that mean? Does that mean that the... The Big Bang is a mystery, you know, or maybe it's not a mystery. Maybe the physical world that Hawking said exploded into existence didn't explode and nothing happened and it wasn't there anyway. It's just a nice story. But in any case, uh, Davies doesn't explain how reality and knowledge gets entangled. I'm not quite sure what that means. Then there's Max Planck. Now, he is about as sober a German physicist as it's possible to get. I don't know who it was, somebody famous once said everything sounds at least twice as serious when you say it in German. Um, now, he was the, he's the father of quantum mechanics, this guy. He's got a Nobel Prize in his pocket. He also died in 1947. I'm talking about him like he's around today. He's very highly respected. And then in 1931, in the London Observer, on page 17, he writes, or he's quoted as having said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. In other words, consciousness comes first and matter and energy in the universe and everything comes second. This is all terribly new age. And it's not a case of editorial liberty. Oh, by the way, there it is, just there on, on, in that little box. Um, it's not a case of editorial liberty. In 1944, in a talk in Florence, he said it again. He said, there is no matter as such. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of the existence of a conscious and intelligent spirit. The spirit is the matrix of all matter, and that was in a speech in Florence in 1944. Now, Henry Stapp is a, a, a very well-known physicist. Uh, he was a mate of Heisenberg and a mate of Bohr, and he worked with, with von Neumann and others, so he's been around. He says, Consciousness in some form must be a fundamental quality of the universe. Okay? It seems to him unlikely that human ideas could emerge from a universe devoid of idea-like qualities. So he thought consciousness must be in there somewhere. Now, is consciousness fundamental? Well, there is a way of thinking about that. I don't buy the story, but the story is told very well by David Chalmers. All right? He gave a TED talk and he offered an explanation for how we might arrive at such a conclusion, and I'll play the video for you so you can hear it. Physicists sometimes take some aspects of the universe as fundamental building blocks, space and time and mass. They postulate fundamental laws governing them, like the laws of gravity or quantum mechanics. These fundamental properties and laws aren't explained in terms of anything more basic. Rather, they're taken as primitive and you build up the world from there. Now, sometimes the list of fundamentals expands. In the 19th century, Maxwell figured out that you can't explain electromagnetic phenomena in terms of the existing fundamentals space, time, mass, Newton's laws. 
So he postulated fundamental laws of electromagnetism and postulated electric charge as a fundamental element that those laws govern. Well, I think that's the situation we're in with consciousness. If you can't explain consciousness in terms of the existing fundamentals, space, time, mass, charge, then as a matter of logic, you need to expand the list. The natural thing to do is to postulate consciousness itself as something fundamental, a fundamental building block of nature. So, um, Carlo Rovelli, the um, quant loop quantum gravity theorist, he's at, the, um, uh, at Marseille at the moment, and I'm having a fun email exchange with him. Um, he thinks time goes around in circles. He thinks you can go forward in time in a continuous trajectory towards the future and return to the originating event to where you began. Okay? Now, this is ancient Greek and Hindu and Buddhist philosophy. I don't think it's physics. I don't know how to make sense of that. What he forgot to tell you in the book, The Order of Time, is that this is only ever supposed to happen in the centre of black holes and there are very good reasons why you can't get to the centre of a black hole. So, you know, why is he bothering? But it's a nice story. It sells. Okay. Um, David Deutsch, he thinks that reality consists of a multiverse of up to 10 to the power 500 weekly interacting universes, each slightly different of course, and there's additional universes popping into existence with every elementary quantum interaction. That's 10 to the power 123 complete universes per second. This has to be the most profligate theory any physicist has ever invented, right? It, it, you've got to be very generous. You need a really vivid imagination to think you can create that many universes. Again, where are they coming from? Are they popping in from nothing as well? I don't think that makes sense, but that's the way the, the um, uh, quantum mechanics people try to explain some of their theories. So next time someone asks me, how am I? I'll have to say, I'm every how, thank you. <laughs> Right? Just like everybody else. I'm, I'm every how. Just in this universe, I've got a sore back, but in another universe, I'm perfectly fine. Okay. Back to Stephen Hawking again. He says, not only are there that many universes, but every possible version of the universe exists simultaneously in what is called a quantum superposition. So next time someone asks me, what did you do today? I'll have to tell them, I said, I had a very busy day. Here I gave a talk at uh, Springwood in another universe. I just swam the English Channel. And the third universe, I just had a sex change operation. I mean, you know, it's been, a ver it's been one hell of a day, you know. Okay? Now, there are many more seemingly peculiar stories, but you get the general idea, okay? Let's put them all together. I, 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 this is a bit of mischief, okay? I've put all these stories together. This is what the scientists would have you believe about what reality is like. Okay, in the beginning, I had to put that in. In the beginning, there was only physical nothingness. Then, 13.8 billion years ago, information about the future, about the future development of the laws of physics, caused this nothingness to explode into 10 dimensional universe of quantum probabilities composed purely of information and mathematics. <laughs> Further information from the future, this time about the evolution of human consciousness, also reached back in time and converted some of these probabilities into physical matter. From this moment forward, cosmic consciousness caused countless more physical universes to pop out of the remaining nothingness at a rate of 10 to the power 123. That's a number with 123 zeros. That's a big number. Um, and now we are present. We're, we're, we're there. We now exist inside over 10 to the power 500 of them. The whole shebang is expanding at, a, at an accelerating rate, causing more quantum nothingness, creating more quantum nothingness as it goes. And with time going around in circles, our consciousness is even now hurtling towards its own creation. Now, who thinks reality is like that? <laughs> Hands up, be honest. Oh, there's one or two. You're brave, I can tell you. Who thinks it's not like that? Uh, I, think, I think that's where the vote has to go, right? I think the majority of you say no. That, that can't be right. But if you look at that, the, refer the references for that article read like a who's who of science. I'm not making this up. 
I could write these references at the bottom and have everything quoted uh, and cited and it would be, it'd be published, it'd be peer-reviewed and published. And there are, in fact, people who have done exactly that. Here's Hugo Rodriguez. Uh, I won't read the text. It's an absolute... It's a, it's a wonderful text in New Age Deepak Chopra self-help pop psychology. It's wonderful stuff. And every single page on it has a quotation from Stephen Hawking, David Deutsch, Henry Stapp. It's, it's a remarkable work. Okay? But it's nonsense from beginning to end. So, is this really how things are? Well, maybe not. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this. Uh, and we might ask then, are we living in a wonderland or are we living in a fantasy land? Or are scientists making stuff up? All right? So, are we in wonderland? Are we with Alice down the rabbit hole? Or are we in, with Walt Disney in some kind of fantasy land? Well... You won't be surprised to hear that uh, Professor Michaela Massimi from the University of Edinburgh thinks the answer is fantasy land and she thinks that physicists and cosmologists are making stuff up. Okay? And here's what she says. She says, in around the 1960s, the project of science changed from a quest for truth in other words, trying to answer the question, what is the world really like, to just mathematical puzzle solving. Okay? The trouble is mathematics is a nice tool for description, but it's not an abductive tool. You can't actually work out what causes what mathematically. In fact, what she wrote was exactly... Oh, um, there was, in fact, a scant regard for reality. Uh, in fact, what she wrote exactly was this, um, but it, it says the same thing. So I asked Paul Davies, I saw Paul Davies at a conference uh, uh, some time ago, and I asked him, he said, why would scientists be making stuff up? And he said, well, we don't know the answer, so we would have to just try things. This was his exact words. So he kind of realises, he knows he's making stuff up, but he's not letting on. He's still publishing his books and still telling everybody, this is the new answer, this is the new science. But they're just making stuff up. I have a question for him too, and that is, shouldn't we be trying things that make some sort of sense? Really? I mean, can't we put some sort of limit on what kind of things we try? Or do we just try any old thing? Is this just a game of throw it up in the air and see what happens? Well, apparently, you don't put constraints on it. Here's Grant Lewis, a professor of astrophysics, and a colleague of mine down at Sydney. I asked him, I was at a uh, physics seminar and... and uh, on the 29th of February 2016, I asked him, I said, you know, what's going on here? And he says, oh, physics is concerned only with making predictions. We leave worrying about reality to the philosophers. So scientists aren't interested in reality. Maybe. In other words, physics is concerned with, with describing the results of experiments, but it is not concerned with explaining what's actually going on. That's not their mission. It hasn't been since about the 1960s. Now, here's another video. That's David Suzuki when he was very much younger. He interviewed David Bohm, who was a mate of Einstein's at Princeton University back in the 1950s. Here it is in 1979. Now, now dealing with that kind of uh, uh, difficulty, of it, how, do you, how do physicists then handle that? Well, they don't handle it. Essentially, they ignore the problem. They say that they, uh, in the old days, people used to want to explain things, you see. Now, they feel it's not necessary that uh, if you can calculate, find equations that enable you to calculate the, what, you know, the observations that we make, it's felt this is enough. That is, one has got to a much more pragmatic approach uh, in the sense that although people don't admit it, they say that the main purpose of physics is to calculate you see, results, you see. Uh, it's true. We ignore the problem. We just work out that we can do calculations and, and it doesn't matter. We don't try and explain anything because we can't. So, again, physicists understand that they're making stuff up. They really know this, but they're not telling you. So what I'm here to tell you is that you should be a little bit more sceptical about what you read. When you read all those books that I've listed there, don't trust them, okay? They're making stuff up. So, to our second question then, is science actually pursuing the correct description of reality? The answer is sadly a qualified no. 
And nowhere is this disregard for reality more evident than in quantum mechanics. In 2011, there was an international quantum foundations conference called Quantum Physics and the Nature of Reality. You see, physicists pretend to be interested in reality, or maybe some physicists are interested in reality. This was actually in Trankirchen in Austria. It's a gorgeous place. You've got to go. It's about 75 kilometers east of Salzburg. It's absolutely wonderful. Don't go when it's crawling with physicists. At this conference, Max Schlosshauer was one of the delegates, and he surveyed his fellow delegates. He made up this little questionnaire, and he passed it around. There were about 60 people there. And he asked them questions like, how do you make sense of the nature of physical reality? What is quantum indeterminacy? How do you make sense of non-locality or entanglement and all, all these things that nobody understands? And he published the results in a paper. The reason he did this because depending on how you answer these questions, you can come up with 14 different notions of what reality is and 14 different interpretations of quantum mechanics. It turns out they're all on Wikipedia. And here they are. Okay? There's 14 different interpretations. The green is yes, the pink is no. And depending on how you say yes or no to them, you get 14 mutually exclusive interpretations of quantum mechanics. Only, at most, one of them is correct. The other 13 must be wrong. Six of them have Nobel Prizes against them, so five of them have to be wrong too. It's, 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 it's an interesting situation. And he published it in a, in a paper. Now, here are the results that he got from his survey. Notice that there's no consensus. There's not even a majority view. There's not even an interpretation of quantum mechanics that half the best theoretical physicists in the world would agree to. The one that gets the highest number of votes is the Copenhagen interpretation. It comes in at 42%. The only reason it comes in top is because it's the one you get taught first when you go to university. And people anchor on it and say, oh, that, you know, we'll go with that one. He also asked them a question how much is the choice of interpretation a matter of personal philosophical prejudice? In other words, is there a fact of the matter or are you just making it up? And only 15% said there was a fact of the matter. The other 85% said, well, you can more or less make it up as much as you like. Really? Is that physics? So in other words, reality is whatever you want it to be. And his conclusion says... Quantum theory is based on a clear mathematical apparatus. It has enormous significance for the material sciences, natural sciences, enjoys phenomenal predictive success. It does. You wouldn't have laser pointers and radios and computers and TVs. and You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have anything without it. It's fabulous stuff. And it plays a critical role in modern technological development. Absolutely no argument. It does all that. And yet, now over 90 years after the theory's development, there's no consensus in the scientific community regarding what it means or how it works. And this poll is an urgent reminder of the peculiar situation. Well, it is peculiar, I grant it. And the problem is ubiquitous. The problem is everywhere. I'd like to demonstrate this, okay? I'd like to show you that your sense of reality is just as ambiguous as everybody else's. So I'd like to take a quick survey. I told you there's lots of audience participation in this. Um, I want to gauge your own off-the-cuff intuitions about reality. Okay? To do this, I'm going to ask you to answer, do a little quiz. Answer 10 quick questions, all yes-no questions. Um, there's no right or wrong answers because I only want your opinion. I don't really want you to tell me what the facts are. I just want you to tell me what you think they are. Um, there's no prize for saying yes to more questions. You don't get prize for saying yes to 11 of the 10 questions either. Um, you do your own marking and your privacy is protected. You don't have to tell me the answer. You don't have to tell me what you said yes or no to. The only thing I'm going to ask you at the end is to tell me how many of these questions you answer with a yes. Okay? You can count them on your fingers and make a, make a serious note of what number you come up with. Don't talk to the person next to you. And don't change your mind when you hear the next person give an answer different to the one you were going to give. Right? So stick with your own answer and I'll show you a very interesting result. Okay. You ready? Here we go. How many of these ten things do you think are real? How many of them really exist? Let's go through them. One, do you yourself really exist? Are you real? 
You for real? Okay. Do apples? Are apples real? What about electrons? Are electrons real? Rainbows? Are rainbows real? How about light? Is light real? Okay, is darkness real? What about the number zero? Is the number zero real? Triangles? Are triangles real? Unicorns? Are unicorns real? Not reindeer. Unicorns. Are unicorns real? What about Santa Claus? Is Santa Claus real? There's a child in the room. Shh. Okay, keep that one to yourself. Okay, is Santa Claus real? Okay, ten questions. Um, I'll put the answer in a spreadsheet. Well, there's the answer. There's the result. No consensus. No majority view. It's not even a normal distribution. There's no standard pattern. There's nothing, right? But, guess what? Given that we all know what rainbows and triangles are, our disagreement can't be about what rainbows and triangles are. Our disagreement must be over the nature of reality. That's the question that you're disagreeing about, right? Agree? That's, that's where the trouble is, right? And did you notice that as you were answering the questions, although the questions were all of the same form, they were all asked, is X real? They were actually not all asking the same thing, were they? You had to sort of notice that there was something funny going on that it, the same sort of answer didn't work for all the questions. That's the problem. That's the issue here. Now, I'm not surprised. I did this in a couple of philosophy cafes back in 2011. There were 20 questions in that quiz, but the 10 questions I just asked you were in those 20. I just extracted it to make it a bit shorter. And this is the result I got from 100 people. But interestingly enough, I then decided, OK, I'm going to try this with my students at uni. And over the years, I've been accumulating the statistics from my different classes. Here are the results from 220 of my students between 2012 and 2016 or thereabouts. OK? Again, no consensus. And you'll notice it's a pat there's a pattern here, right? It's roughly the same distribution. Now, we can unpack this. This actually makes sense. We can work out what's going on here. Here's what the experts think. If you ask Bishop George Berkeley, a philosopher back from the, um, from the 17th, 18th centuries, he would have said yes to all 20 questions. If you ask Plato, he would have said yes to between about 15 or 17 of these questions. If you ask David Hume, he would have said yes to about 13 or 14 of them. You can get this out of the literature. You can see what they would think and what they would say. You ask Einstein, he would say yes to about six or seven of them. You ask René Descartes, and he would have said yes to just two of them. Sorry? Oh, for Descartes, himself and his thoughts were two. They were the two questions that he would say yes to. Because he, had to, he was thinking and he himself existed because he was thinking. So he knew about those two things. Didn't know anything else existed, but he was sure about He was imagining everything else. So he said yes to two. And if you go down to Benedict Spinoza, he would have said yes to none of them. Okay? So the experts, the philosophers and the scientists, disagree based on their philosophical view for exactly the same reason that you all disagree and for exactly the same reason as all the physicists disagree. And, well... I could go into a lot of detail about exactly why that is, and I can tell you what the differences are. Sadly, I don't have time. But, it, but, it, but this, is now, this is now able to be solved. I think we can now crack this and work out exactly what people are thinking. So the next question then is, would, if, if, if we all disagree on what reality is, would we recognise reality if we saw it? Well, some of you wouldn't, some of you wouldn't. There'd be no consensus. You wouldn't agree. So the answer to that, again, would have to be a qualified no, I have to say. So, Houston, we have a problem, all right? We don't know what we're, we don't know what we're looking for, and we wouldn't recognise it even if we saw it. We're in a bit of a scientific problem here. I think we've got a problem, all right? I don't want to overplay this. I think there really is an issue here to think about. And I'm, I hope to make you a little bit uncomfortable about your complacent position of understanding how the world works. I don't think we do. All right. So 
Our next question might be, well, so what? Does it matter? Does reality matter? Do we care? And I think one of the reasons you're here is that you do. We all want answers. We all want to know where we came from. We want to know the meaning and purpose of it all. We want to know, is there life elsewhere in the universe? There's lots of stuff we want to know. And what's more, it's why we study cosmology and archaeology and, and history and, and why many of us embrace religion. We are looking for answers. And not just any answer will do. We want answers about what really happened. We want to know how things really are. We want to know what's really going on. We want realistic, plausible explanations that we can understand and that make sense to us. We don't want stuff we don't understand. We don't want stories, we want facts. And we really don't want stories like the Big Bang happened because some god waved her magic wand, said abracadabra, and poof, there it was. That's not satisfying. Or even stories like Stephen Hawking saying the universe pulled itself into existence by, pull, by tugging itself up by its own shoelaces. You know, these are not the kinds of stories we want. We want things that pass a reality check, a credibility check of some sort. Whatever that means, we have to define what we're prepared to accept as credible, but I think we do want to set some standards for credibility and we want our answers to match that. At the moment, I don't think they're passing. Sean Carroll, in fact, highlights a more serious problem. He says, no theory in history of science has been more misused and abused by cranks and charlatans and philosophers. Okay and misunderstood by people struggling in good faith with difficult ideas, including philosophers, than quantum mechanics. And it's true. Sean Carroll says, if scientists are held up as the authority on matters of fact, and, you know, which they should be, I suppose, and if we are expected to take seriously their pseudo-scientific pronouncements, because they don't sound terribly scientific if we do the, do the thinking, and scientists are making stuff up, then we are at risk of being seriously misled. And I think we are. I think we are being misled. And I think we should be sensitive to this. And this is exactly what's happening. From Stephen Hawking's uh, idea that every possible version of the universe exists simultaneously, it's all out there at once, and Max Planck's idea that consciousness is fundamental, you can get things like this. You get John Searle's quantum free will, where he says your free will comes from quantum mechanics. It's nonsense from beginning to end, if you think about it hard enough, but it sells. You also get uh, Rhonda Byrne's Law of Attraction. You all remember The Secret? Don't be too sanguine about this. That book sold over 20 million copies in 52 languages. People buy this stuff. It's nonsense, but people buy it. I think this is dangerous. And then you get Deepak Chopra and all his pop psychology and New Age, whatever. So, I don't know. I, I think that, that this stuff is just, just difficult. And he's got Max Planck on his side. He can quote scientists from here to breakfast time, and you can't argue with him. And then you get books like this, where consciousness became the universe. It's got a list of authors that is very impressive. Roger Penrose is there, um, Deepak Chopra, Henry Stapp, the physicist, Hameroff is an anesthetist, anesthetist or something. Um, they're, they're, it's a real who's who. Again, it's all pop psychology and nonsense. I don't think any of it is scientific. And from this stuff... It's really only just a short step. You don't have to go too far to get the new modern science of mental health, right? I mean, these guys can quote scientists at you, and it's not very far to go to get that. Now, I think this is a dangerous trajectory. I think we should be on our guard. We should be a little bit more careful about what we regard as scientific and what we put up as fact, what we present as fact. This is a call to arms for the physicists, as well as for you to be a little bit more sceptical about what you do. Implausible, sensational stuff, making stuff up, doesn't draw people to science. It actually tempts them away. Because now, 
you can believe anything you like because it's no more implausible than the stuff the scientists are telling you. Bad science, I would argue, actually promotes anti-science. I think it's a serious problem. The problem is well recognised. Uh, Fred Kuttner and Bruce Rosenblum wrote this article here. It says, we should not underestimate how persuasively physics can be invoked to buttress mystical notions. We physicists bear some responsibility for the way our discipline is exploited. And this was in a physics journal. So it's well recognised. Other people have written about it. And indeed, we shouldn't deride people for their new age ideas. What we should do is reproach the physicists for setting them up. The problem comes back to science. And again, I spoke to Grant Lewis about this. He doesn't know what the solution is, but he recognises there's a problem. Again, the physicists know about this, but it's an industry. It sells books. What can you do? It makes money. So, fanciful pseudoscientific explanations, especially when they're promulgated by experts, have this effect. They render fundamental scientific principles optional because some comply and some don't and you can't tell and they're all supposed to be true. It legitimises illogical and unscientific ideas, again for the same reason. It accords sense and nonsense, equal standing. It confuses you. It's an exercise in obfuscation. It reduces science to a faith-based belief system. It becomes no better than a religion after a while and it invites further quackery and confounds scientific literacy. And don't forget, scientifically illiterate people also vote. So again, this has serious consequences. I, I think a cavalier disregard for scientific principles does lead to some serious consequences. To stop science from doing this, from fueling anti-science, you could, for example, stop regarding scientists as supreme authority on matters of fact. Well, you need some training in order to be able to do that. You've got to stand up to them and you need some reasons for doing it. That's not easy. You might also not take too seriously their scientific pronouncements, especially when they seem so counterintuitive. And you might get the scientists to refrain from making stuff up. Wouldn't that be nice? No one knows how to do that. Or we might try getting some of some rules for, for what it is reasonable to believe. That's something we can each do. We can each improve the way we go around accepting things. For scientific theories to be reasonable, there are rules. They have to be internally coherent. That means they have to be logical. They have to be intelligible and reasonable and so on. They have to be externally consistent with all the things you observe in the world. And they also have to be realistic. They have to be somehow implementable they have to be somehow compliant with something that you can imagine a world, a physical world, might be like. Physical theories, in fact, have to accord with reality and not the other way around. It's not a case of the physicist coming up with a theory and say, here, this theory tells you what reality is like. Because on that basis, it's a little bit like shooting an arrow at, a, at and whatever it hits, doesn't matter, that's the target. Okay? If you declare your own reality, then every theory is correct because everyone creates its own reality. That's not the way to find out what's correct. You need a sense of reality and then you have to see if your arrow hits the target. So your theories have to comply with reality and not the other way around, right? Theories that prescribe their own reality can never be falsified. A realistic theory is one that makes sense. It's descriptions in terms of clearly defined concepts with which we are suitably familiar not so in quantum mechanics and their ideas of wavicles, which is sort of half wave, half particle, where the properties of waves and particles are utterly incommensurable. So you can't have such a thing. So they just made up a name and said, okay, well, that's how... You can't do that, all right? You need physically ca physical causal descriptions of physical processes. You understand the mechanics of what goes on, and in fact, you need explanations in terms of physical mechanisms, which none of our elementary physics has. Quantum mechanics doesn't have it, gravity doesn't have it, we don't know how any, even magnetism doesn't have it, we don't know how any of these things actually do what they do. We know that they do it, and we can describe how it looks, but we can't explain what's going on to make it happen. We actually don't understand the fundamentals of any of this stuff. All we have are symptomatic descriptions of what's going on. 
So to make sense of our theories, we're going to need some definitions. We need to define reality, physicality, causation, mechanism. Again, I don't have time to do all that, so I won't do it today, but I, I can do it and I have done it. So the purpose of scientific, the scientific enterprise, then, I think is threefold. It is supposed to describe how the world is and how the things work. It's supposed to do that. It's supposed to make counterfactual predictions so that we can make technology out of them. And we want to describe or explain how things came to be the way they are rather than somehow else. So you need some kind of history of what went bang or something. You want to know something about what was in the past and that will allow you then to project into the future and see what might happen next, right? Okay, well, they don't do that very well. I'm sorry. As I've shown you, I don't think that they're doing it very well at all. So what I propose to do is put that down the bottom and say, no, they're not doing that. Instead, what they are doing is they're describing how the world appears to be, which is not the same thing as describing how the world actually is. Right? So they're good at describing appearances. I'll give them a tick for that. I'll give them a tick for making predictions, and we've got technology galore coming out of it. They're fantastic at that. In fact, I'll even give them a gold star. They're really good at making predictions. And, well... Yeah, maybe. I don't think they're very good at telling us how things were and how they came to be this way. There's plenty of work to be done in that area. So that's a pass, but it's not a high distinction. Okay? It's all right, but we can do better than that. And I think we can do better by using a little bit of philosophy. So let me tell you what philosophy does. Let me tell you, see if I can describe philosophy for you. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what philosophy is. It's hard to define, but I think Anthony Quinton from Oxford did a rather good job. He said philosophy is rationally critical thinking of a more or less systematic kind about, one, the general nature of the world, two, the justification of belief, and three, the conduct of life. It's rough, and there's plenty of other things that he said, but it's not a bad first step. So let me go with this, and let me, again, draw a flowchart. This is what it looks like. Okay, we've got theorising about the general nature of the world. In philosophy, we call that ontology. It's about theories about reality and existence. Sometimes it's called metaphysics. Then we've got theorising or critical thinking about the justification of belief. That's logic and theories of validity and truth, the ways of knowing, and that, that's epistemology. There's plenty of work there to be done. And then there's th thinking about the conduct of life. That's called axiology in the trade. It's a word seldom used. It's about theories of value and worth. It's where all your morals and ethics come from. Okay? So that's philosophy. Now, remember that flowchart I drew of science? Let's put the two together. Because, in fact, they fit. And this is how they fit together. You can use your knowledge that you've accrued from your scientific observations to inform your theorising, to inform how you construct theories about reality and existence, how you work out how you know things and what it is reasonable to say that you know and so on. You work out your logic because there are patterns in the world that you have to mimic in your logic to make your logic work and so on. So knowledge has to feed into your philosophy. And then your philosophy has to feed into your science. Each of these will feed in. Your, on to your theories about reality will work out what you're observing will help you make those decisions. Your axioms and rules of reasoning will work out, will tell you how to think. And your theories of truth and so on will work out what you know. And then of course, if you know all about the value of everything and the price of nothing, then you're going to be wise as well. Now, for the purposes of this talk, we don't need all the technology stuff, so I'll put that aside. And we don't need all the ethics and morals, that's a whole other talk, so we'll put that aside. And this, is what scientists do, and this is what philosophers do. And you'll notice that the two are in fact inextricably connected. Okay? Each one does different work. The philosophers work over here on the left, the scientists work over here on the right, but they have plenty of things that they do in common or plenty of things to say to each other. In fact, it's a philosophy that makes a science scientific. Whether something is scientific or not is, by definition, not a scientific question. It's a philosophical question. OK, so in the first instance, philosophers must listen to the scientists very carefully. 
work out what their observations are, work out what they understand. Don't listen too much to their theories. The theorising has to come later. But their observations are valuable, and based on those valuable observations, the philosophers have to abstract their top-level characterization of what they, think, what they think reality is. So that means philosophers have to define what a plausible physical reality might look like. And then the scientists have to listen to the philosophers after the philosophers have done their work and reformulate their theories in those philosophically plausible realistic terms, which means that they have to come up with theories that are both physically and metaphysically plausible and then you and I can believe them. Okay, so here we have the business of going from right to left. We abductively infer, that's technical jargon, sorry, we have to, if you like, distill out of our science what our theories of reality have to be, and then we have to make sense of the world by applying what we've learnt back to our observations and re-explaining our observations in those terms. So, science needs philosophy and philosophy needs science. I don't think there's any question about this. In fact, Einstein said so. He almost said this. He said, science without philosophy is lame and philosophy without science is blind. He actually said it about science and religion, but it, it works the same way. Philosophy, religion is just one branch of philosophy, if you want to think of it that way. So, ultimately, reality itself is the final arbiter of whether our physical theories are, uh, are correct. That's what it means to be correct. Our scientific theories must accord with reality and not the other way around. And reality is under no obligation to comply with our cherished theories. It's up to us to work out what reality is, not up to reality to say, oh, I think we'll be different because Tibor wants it that way. I don't think that's likely. So once we've decided what reality is, we then have to ensure that our scientific theories are consistent with it, Otherwise, even if our theories are excellent in every other way, they're simply not going to be physical theories about our real world. They just won't be telling us what our world is like. And I presume that that's something that we want our physical theories to be. I think that's what we want. We don't want this. This doesn't work. I don't think we accept this as a scientific explanation. Okay? This is, this is what we're trying to avoid. And the only way to avoid that is, in fact, to have some sense of reality. Making sense of reality, then, is a joint task, a task for both scientists and philosophers, and together with a little goodwill, and I have another talk which I give where I show that there's actually not much goodwill going, it's not happening, but with a little goodwill, you can each, each group can reach a workable understanding of reality, and I think it's something that both disciplines sorely need. I don't think philosophers have all the answers, I think they're doing an awful lot of things wrong too, uh, but so they can each learn from the other if only they decided to talk to each other, but for that, clearly, they need to get together and have a long chat. Now, let me end with some blatant self-promotion. If you'd like to know more, then you can look me up on my website or my Facebook page. You can contact me, ask questions, send me emails. If you'd like a copy of these slides, get in touch with me and I'm happy to give you a copy of the slides. I saw some people out there taking photos. Um, I'm happy to give you the PowerPoint presentation. That's no problem. This leaves only for me to acknowledge my research team this is my research team. If you don't recognise the faces, there are the names. I've got the most comprehensive research team going. I'm, I'm delighted with the work they've done for me. Uh, you know about standing on the shoulders of giants? Well, I'm about a million miles high standing on their shoulders. And let me thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you.